Why does academics have such little to do with actual life success? So much of success is driven by like timing and connections and like school doesn't really like provide either of those things. I don't have my MBA. We hired people who didn't graduate from college, who had no MBAs. Like that was never like a prerequisite of ours. I don't think school was ever necessarily set up for like entrepreneurial success, right? No. No. I just think certain categories, there's like much more regional loyalty. Yeah, because there's a couple of guys like local to us that started a kombucha company and they took off and they're in every Whole Foods or in every... Which kombucha company? Like it's 226 or something like that. It's local to us. Certain categories in the grocery store, it's harder to get into because they only want small regional players. They don't want to fill it with like a bunch of national nationwide players. What did uh, working at Kavita teach you like in terms of the CPG space in general? I mean, like everything. I was, this was like my, I mean, I worked in an advertising agency before Kavita and we, I was working with like the Frito-Lay Growth Ventures team. So a lot of like brands Frito-Lay owns that doesn't have Frito-Lay on the package. Like Stacy's Pita Chips, also like the Frito-Lay, like organic line, Tostitos, Frito-Lay, whatever. Um, but Kavita was my first experience in like startup world. Like I was there when they were sub 10 million in sales. They were running it out of like a garage in Oxnard, California. I met Amanda, who now works with me at Primal Kitchen there, she hired me at Kavita, and I learned a lot about just like retail, marketing, launching a product. I had an accounting degree. So you're a numbers person? Yes. That's insane. Yes. That is so great. I don't know that I would say I'm a numbers person. Math has always like been easy for me. I used to do like biofeedback. Have you ever heard of like biofeedback? It's where they like put these like little electrodes on your brain and they kind of like can see what's going on. And I remember she was like, oh, you're like my, this is years ago. It's like 20 years ago. She was like, oh, you're like my husband. You have like kind of equal right and left brain. So I don't think I'm like, I don't think I like over index on one side or the other. But math was easy for me. School was, I was like a C's get degrees, like I didn't get a lot of C's, but my parents were very like, C's get degrees. I went to University of Colorado. There wasn't a lot of like academic pressure for me to like go to an Ivy League school or anything like that. I was never like seen as like the most intelligent of my group. I have very smart friends in high school who all went to like, you know, Ivy League, sub Ivy League colleges. And I was kind of just like middle of the pack. Is it, do you think it's weird that like, cause I, I was in the same situation. I went to a private school where everybody, went to Ivy League. I was in a public school, but okay. yeah. I went to private school. Everybody went to Ivy League. And yet it seems as though I my, my case study is still playing out, but it seems in your case study that you ended up probably being one of the more successful people in that group. Why, why does academics have such little to do with actual life success, at least business success from what you've seen? Because I imagine you probably had people applying from Ivy League schools to all the different companies that you've worked with worked for i just think in the end of the day like so much of success is driven by like timing and connections and like school doesn't really like provide either of those things so like i think primal kitchen was so successful because we had like the right product at the right time and good execution and a good brand right but like i don't know that i mean i don't have my mba we didn't hire anyone like we hired people who didn't graduate from college who had no MBAs like that was never like a prerequisite of ours I mean Mark didn't even ever ask me for a resume I mean <laughs> this is like Southern California you know like going a lot off like vibes and passion <laughs> and like good energy and just like are they gonna have like a good work ethic or not so I don't know I think I don't think school was ever necessarily set up for like entrepreneurial success, right? Like, no, no, no. Um, so let's get back into the story. So you're working at, you, you were working at the agency as an accountant. So I graduated college. I, with an accounting degree, I got two job offers on the same day. One was to be a recruiter and one was to go work as like a staff accountant at an advertising agency. I took the recruiting job because it came with a Blackberry. This was 2006. Six, 2006 and I was like this is cool I'm gonna get a Blackberry there was no such thing as an iPhone back then um, so I took the job and then three days in I was like oh this is terrible like I hate doing this recruiting thing like in three days so I called the accounting firm and I was like can I get that job you offered me that I declined and they were like sure it's still open like we'll take you so I worked there for a year and then I quit that job it's a common theme I quit that job to go waitress at my aunt and uncle's resort in northern Wisconsin saved up a lot of money and then moved to South America for like two and a half years. So I. What age was this? I was 20, like three or something like that. Holy 22, cow. 24. Yeah. 
what what were the last day like the last day before you left did you know you were going to leave for that long no, I was. I convinced um, Primal Kitchen's now marketing director, who was my first hire and one of my best friends from childhood, who I've known forever. I convinced her to move with me to South America. So we were supposed to just go for six months to Argentina. So we had like an apartment in Buenos Aires, and um, I was like was doing an online like photography class. I was just like I made like thirty grand waitressing that summer, like net of all my expenses at the end of the year. So I had like all this cash saved up, and I figured like if I spend ten grand in South America for six months, like that's cool, um, which is totally doable. I lived off eight grand a year, and then I ended up getting this job doing research for a political author. So I was like working just from the computer. I've still never met this author. I'm like the first acknowledgement in like six New York Times bestselling political books. Um, and yeah, so I was making like 12 grand a year. I kept like doing these books with this author and then I would do all the like fact checking and research he would send me kind of what he wanted the book to be about and I was reading the four-hour work week like Tim Ferriss's book was really popular then and I was thinking well, the hell am I reading this book for like I'm doing this four-hour work week thing I'm like surfing I learned how to surf in Peru so my six-month trip turned into two and a half years I just we met these girls from Ireland they were on their kind of like gringo trail doing like a whole year in between college and the real world and I just like joined them and I went home to the States after six months and I went from like Argentina to Colombia by bus with these girls from Ireland. I learned how to surf in Peru, got this gig doing this research for this political author that I just funded my travels. I came home at 23 or 24 and all my friends had like, you know, debt. They're living in downtown Chicago. They're spending like $100 every night. They go out to the bars taking taxis this is before uber like cabbing from you know wrigleyville to <laughs> cold coast back, whatever and i had all this money saved because i was living off like literally eight thousand dollars a year um but making like 12 so i was just like really rich for a 24 year old you know living the life what were what was the key differentiator between you and your friends when you got back and did you feel somewhat socially I had terrible reverse culture shock. I call it like reverse culture shock. This is like a common thing. So at the end of my time back, I traveled all over. I ended up living in Mexico for a while, lived in Costa Rica for a while, ended up back in Ecuador, surfed like all over the place, um, but got my yoga certification in Hawaii, um, came back and I was just like, oh, where do I fit in? What do I want to do with my life? I mean, really like I had like a really hard time, like people. I remember at the time, like, jeans were becoming, like, you know, it wasn't just, like, you didn't go buy, like, a $60 pair of jeans. Like, people were buying, like, seven from All Mankind or whatever those jeans are, and they were, like, $200, and I was, like, what? Like, I didn't spend $200, like, in a week in South America, right? So I was just, like, really struggling with, like, assimilating back into life in the United States, um, and but didn't really feel like I belonged in the vagabond life anymore either. So it's just like this time in my life where I felt like, where do I really belong? And quite honestly, like, I don't think that feeling has like fully gone away. Like, I think there's just like a little bit always of like Adam and I, I mean, we live in Southern California, but all our families in the Midwest, you know, we're just still feel a little bit like outliers a little bit that kind of outliers. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a that's I for some reason. Everybody that I've talked to that is on your level is in that space. They all say the same thing. They've all at one point in their life felt like they were the, you know, the, 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 the person that stood out amongst everybody else in there. And they had to get comfortable with that. Cause that's not a fun way to feel like you want to, I think our whole childhood, we always look to fit in. And we, when we get older, we're like, oh wow, actually the people that didn't fit in were probably the end up being the most successful, the most interesting, they've lead, lead the most interesting life. How would you direct somebody now that feels like that in their 20s? Well, I'll just go back to that really quick though, because I think it's important. Like I never felt like I didn't fit in. I didn't like stand out among my group of friends growing up. Like I don't think, I was never like 
an outlier in my childhood. Like I had formative early experiences. Like I went to camp for eight weeks when I was eight years old that I think like highlighted maybe some like leadership skills that were just like there in my personality. Like I got elected to like a camp council at the age of nine and most kids weren't on camp council until they were like 12. So I think there was like things that, and I like even forgot that story, but I'm still good friends with a a friend of mine, Mary Rob, who I went to camp with. And she always like reminds me like, oh, remember when you were like, on camp console when you were like six years old and you know whatever and I'm like oh I don't know I didn't even think about it but I was like a mediocre student a mediocre athlete like very social I was not like I was not like weird but you, but in your 20s in my 20s, I came back. up and I didn't fit in. I mean, everybody kind of was on this path, and I like was on a different path. And for sure. in that cl- qualification, that's a that's a weird. That's a weird, you know what I mean? That's for sure. I would say like, then just move to California. (laughs) Like everyone's weird in California. So like, if you feel like you don't fit in, go like change your environment. You know, like sometimes if you've kind of moved one way and everybody else is like still on the same path, like you need to like be in a different place. But I think like figuring out what you want to do. Like I spent a lot of time, um, thinking about that in my 20s like I was like do I want to be a natural I applied to naturopathic doctor schools like should I be a sex therapist maybe I want to be a nurse I want to like launch this product like I wanted to do everything um and I think the biggest tip is just like to just do what's next and you don't need to like know what you want to do forever just figure out what you want to do next and and then you just keep moving forward and it all like it, it all makes sense in hindsight it doesn't like need to make sense looking forward Interesting. Okay, so picking back up where we were, you got back, kind of were like, wow, like a reverse culture shock. And then what followed into the advertising agency and everything following? So, yeah, I came back from South America. I realized, like, I bought the domain surfyogaecuador.com, and I wanted to, like, launch a surf yoga retreat in Ecuador. And then I was like, Ugh, I don't know, I'm kind of, like, not into this. Um, or I just like, didn't follow through. And then I... Went to work, a friend of mine's older sister hired me to help her with her, like, backpack company. That was super cool, actually. Like, it was, it's not like, it's like a blip on the resume. It's not even on the resume. But it was just, like, a cool experience and just, like, a, you know, super, like, scrappily run little company. And I got to, like, be really impactful. Um, and it was fun. And my friend's older sister is awesome. So it was just super fun. And then I started looking for real jobs. Um, and through, like, my uncle connected me with his friend I started dating a guy who lived in Milwaukee Wisconsin so I got connected from my uncle to this friend of his who owned an advertising agency and he interviewed me and he's like advertising agency agency people are also like weird you know it's kind of like you have to have like a keg in your kitchen and an advertising agency and like a ping pong table like people want to work with you because they think you're cool like you have to kind of just be different and like out of the box a little bit although then they all just do the same different out of the box things and there <laughs> and so it is but anyway he was very much like what book are you reading right now like his whole thing was like I only was as well as at Culver Brand Design in Milwaukee Wisconsin he was great he's like the, my I like love him he was like a great I person to work for at this age but he was very much like if you wouldn't go on a trip with someone you shouldn't hire them like if you're willing to like travel with them like for work and you would find that like would be fun then that's probably a good hire otherwise like don't hire him but I remember he asked me in my interview like is your car what if I saw your car right now like would it be clean or is it dirty like he was just like asking me like the most random questions and I came on and had like a great run at the advertising agency for two and a half years and then realized like I didn't want to marry that guy and I didn't want to live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I moved to California. I like came out to visit and said Pause yeah, yeah, so pause there. So when did you feel like you were just not being fulfilled in in Milwaukee? Like when when and what was like the lead up in terms of like what you were feeling and what was going through your head to be like, okay, I'm gonna break up with this guy and I'm gonna move and I'm gonna quit my job. I don't think I was I I never like operated off of like I'm feeling a negative feeling so I take an action. I more was just like chasing a positive feeling. And I think that's like a big distinction. I always say like make sure you're like running towards something and not away from something. I think you make like kind of rough decisions when you're just like running away from something. You make decisions that you're maybe like sacrificing something in because you just want to get away from something versus like 
being attracted to something and moving towards that. So for me, I don't think there was any like big overarching negative driver of on the feelings front that caused like this life change. But I think I surfed Lake Michigan in the winter. You have to surf wind swell. Um, and there was like ice chunks in the water. I had like a full wetsuit on with a hood. I have pictures. There's like icicles hanging down from my face. And I was like, okay, this is so fun. Like bucket list item. And then at the time we were working with another advertising agency on the Frito-Lay account. And the, it was this agency 72 and sunny that's headquartered like right by my ho- now house in California um and we came out to do like a ideation session with them and I was like oh this is cool then I I booked another trip back out and like made up a lie to one of their account execs that I wanted to move here because I was thinking like this could be interesting um and she was like meet me in Manhattan Beach and I came and like booked this trip and just like totally fell in love with Manhattan Beach so it was more just like the draw I'd never been to California. I was like 28. I'd never been here before. It was right before Christmas. I spent like a little time here and I was like, oh, like clearly I should live here. Like why would I stay in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Surf windswell. I like surfed. I had the surf session. I laughed. That was still like one of the more fun surf sessions I've ever had in Manhattan Beach. And it's like the waves I've never been <laughs> like that good ever again but it was so fun it drew me in and like a few months later I just went to quit my job and I figured I'd figure find another job when I got out here and my boss at the time the advertising agency was like do you have another job lined up and I was like no and he's like okay you can just work remote so for the first year I was out here I worked remote at the agency and then I was craving like some more interaction with people in California I was a big fan of this kombucha company Kavita and wait can we can we pause right there how did you meet your first 10 friends in California how did I meet my first 10 friends in California I reached out to an old friend of mine that I played soccer with in high school um Kelly she actually works for me at Primal Kitchen now and then everyone in Hermosa they say like when you move here you need to sign up for volleyball and like a lot of people meet their friends through that but I'm five feet tall and I wasn't that good at volleyball so I met some friends surfing I moved in on Craigslist I moved in with a Craigslist roommate this guy from England named Eddie and he was hilarious that's actually how I met my now husband so Eddie like invited me to go play volleyball and I had just surfed in the morning and I was like late to meeting them. I almost didn't go. And then I was like, I'll just go and see what this is about. Maybe I'll meet someone fun. And I met one of my best friends now, Amber, and she introduced me to Adam. She was like friends with Adam. And then we started dating like a few months after that. So I don't know, just putting yourself out there, I guess. I don't. A lot of people don't know even how to, how to make that connection. A lot of people that think about leaving their hometown. um, The only reason that, that, it stops them is because they're like, I'm not going to have any friends. So I just wanted to get your take on how you would make your first 10 friends in a new place. I mean, a Craigslist roommate is great. Um, and then you just got to like say yes to everything. Like I could have just not gone to the beach, right? Or for the, this volleyball game. And I like went down because Eddie invited me, even though I was like, oh, I'm just tired. I surfed all morning. Like I didn't need to go. But I did. And if I didn't, like, would I be married to Adam and have, like, three kids now? You know, maybe not, right? Like, probably not. So it's kind of crazy to think about that. But, yeah, I think you just got to, like, just go to the places and say yes to the things, especially when you're new somewhere. How did you get your job at Kavita? I loved the product. I went on LinkedIn, found, like, a, someone high up at the company. It was, like, their head of sales and reached out and said, like, I'm looking for a job. And he was like, oh, we're actually hiring a director of marketing, which I was – very much not qualified for. Um, but I interviewed for and got the job anyway. <laughs> and here we are. But that's a super, like, just for people listening, accountant, accounting background. Live this anti, yeah, anti-accountant yeah, anti life for a lot of years. Marketing, like, got into a marketing, was in an advertising agency, then into a marketing, like, role. That's a really, really robust amount of jobs, responsibilities. Like what did that, looking back on that, how did that help your career success? You know, looking back at it now, like. I don't think I really have career success. Career success is like you pick something and you like become really masterful at it and you like rise up the chain. I think I have like uh, connection success, like. I think all those things enabled me to like meet more people and hone in on like what I wanted to do. And that led me to like meet Mark and it was like the right time for us to meet and this product was born and it was like a huge success. So I don't know. 
I mean, that's I mean, that's a, that's a good enough answer. I used to say this is like a good story. I when I remember when I took the job at Kavita, Amanda, who hired me, she was consulting for Kavita and a bunch of other companies. And I was like, ooh, maybe one day I could like be Amanda and I could consult for all these different companies. And I did that after I left Kavita. I did that. And then I was like, oh, maybe one day we could like grow and sell Primal Kitchen. And then we like did that. And then I was like, holy shit, I need to start like getting serious about what I'm like maybe one day in my brain because like you might fulfill it. I always remind my team of this, like you might fulfill the dream. So like make sure it's big enough because like my dream could have been bigger than like maybe one day I'll be a marketing consultant, right? Or like even now, I I don't know. I just think that's an important thing to be mindful of. So you get, you get, you walk into this marketing position. Things obviously go well. You end up leaving after some time. You start marketing or you start consulting for other brands. How did you meet Mark? Okay, let's be clear about Kavita. I was there for like seven or eight months and I quit that job too with no job lined up. Okay, so I, it was like, I, I loved my time there, but it was crazy. They were like in a garage, very startup. Um, you know, it's crazy. And I was commuting like an hour and a half to Oxnard. So it was definitely not like, oh, Morgan t steps into this role and like kills it as a marketing director. I mean, I learned a ton and I left on great terms and I like loved the people I met there, but it wasn't like a home run op opportunity for me. I mean, it took a lot of convincing for me to take the job after I got it. Um, and it was like, it was tough. You know, it was a tough role for me. What, what was the, at least the number one thing you learned from that experience though? I learned that... I, we sponsored an event called Primal Con that Mark Sisson put on and Kavita sponsored it. And I learned that even if you can send your marketing manager to the event, you should go yourself if there's someone cool you want to meet there. So that's what I did. I went to this event Mark put on because I wanted to meet Mark, not because I needed to go to the event. And I ended up hitting it off with him and his wife, Carrie, gave them a ride to their hotel room at the end of the night. And like three months later, he called and was like, I want to launch this food company. Can you help? So again, it's just like, saying yes, meeting people. Like there's so much in the world today on like, I remember even saying this at the advertising agency. At the time, people were like email. Like email was just becoming the like currency of the workplace 10 years ago, right? Like before that people had in-person meetings or they picked up the phone. And I remember saying to people like, I had such a great relationship with my clients because I just called them and I wasn't relying on this like email communication back and forth. And now it's like even worse, right? So I think in the end of the day, like people make stuff happen and you just like really need to meet as many people as you can and like put yourself out there just like in a authentic way. I, th I think like curiosity and scrappiness are like my two favorite traits in humans and my two biggest keys to success in business. So I think as much as you can like weave those in that lends itself to just opportunities. So I think it's easy in concept to say, Hey, like I just met this guy and we hit it off. How do you open those conversations? Because I think a lot of people get caught up in like, oh, like I want to go up to this person. I want to tell them like X, Y, and Z, but I just don't know how to start a conversation. I don't know. Like, and it might seem trivial, but it's, I know it plagues a lot of people. So how would you tell somebody that doesn't understand how to start a conversation, how to get people interested in what they have to say? Like, how, how do you stoke that fire of that? conversation or is this just too trivial where you're like I don't I think if you're asking that question you probably like shouldn't be entering the conversation <laughs> to be honest with you no like seriously so I think there's like a background like I have a very much like a threaded health and wellness like passion that's like through I didn't need to think about what I was going to say to Mark when I met him I had been like reading his blog forever and like I had knew a lot about health and wellness and what he was doing and so I don't even remember I mean I think I talked to Carrie more than I talked to Mark the night I met Mark um about like nothing I don't know like I didn't go in with like an agenda this wasn't like me walking up to some random person at like a celebrity event and people were all crowding around and I had like a good one-liner I mean this was just like genuine passion and interest in like a very niche industry and being able to just like live in that space authentically because I authentically was passionate about that space that's that's the lesson in that, though. I think too many people get caught up in what can this person do for me instead of just being like, I'm interested in having like genuine conversation about whatever it is that we're going to have a conversation about. And people just go into it being like, OK, my goal in this conversation or my goal in 
this interaction or whatever. And I think people just end up getting, you know, that's when the, the, well, what do I say? And what's a good opener? And what's a great line? Yeah. yeah. So you start at Primal in circa when? Around what? I met Mark in like 2012 or 2013, maybe. Um, and then we launched the mayonnaise in February of 2015. I started working for Mark as like a $50 an hour marketing consultant. And what was that? What what was that first year like on? I, so it was just a single product that you guys launched? Yeah. And it was a mayonnaise? Yeah. What like, could you even go deeper on that? I like, I want to know what, what, what did Mark see? What did you guys see in the marketplace? Like if we could get a little nerdy. Yeah. Um, like to. Yeah. So Mark knew he wanted to launch a like condiments company. He looked at like Paul Newman was an idol of his and he's like, I mean, there's so much background here. But Paul Newman was an idol of his. He goes to the grocery store and he's like, everything has canola oil or soybean oil, high fructose corn syrup. Like the dressing aisle is like really nasty. So that was kind of the first like, I think, aha moment he had. I'll say like Mark was the OG paleo guy. So he had been edu- he had been selling supplements and educating people on his blog, Mark Staley Apple, um, on just the benefits of fueling with high quality fat, like protein, kind of like carb avoidant, but really really just the tenets of living like what Mark would call like a primal lifestyle. So like play, lifting heavy things, sprinting, um, and eating well. And this eating well really resonated with his audience. So he wanted to launch some products that he couldn't find in the marketplace. So we went out, we actually had a product developed, Mark and I laugh about this, this like Carolina gold barbecue sauce. And Mark was so, he was like, Morgan, I'm putting this on everything. Like we have to launch this barbecue sauce. And I like looked at the ingredient statement and the second ingredient was maple syrup. I mean, I think the formulation was like 33% maple syrup. This is when I was a consultant. And I was like, Mark, you can't like honestly launch this. Like, (laughs) this is like, this is like, you know, if just because at the time, like paleo baked goods were taking off and it was all these people had products in the marketplace that had like 90 grams of sugar in them, but it was the form of honey. So it was fine because it was paleo, right? And I was like, we're, no, no, no. Like, we're not going to be one of those brands. So we hung our hat on like high quality fats, like avocado oil being the main one. Uh, and the absence of sugar, like sugar's public enemy number one. I don't think that trend's going anywhere. And then just this like willingness of consumers to desire things that make eating real food easier. So like, in the world of real food eating, you're having protein, you're having veggies, like things can get boring. Like I just need some good like flavor systems, sauces, condiments, et cetera, to make my protein and veggies taste good. So that was really as simple as it was. We launched after our one mayonnaise skew. Mayonnaise was our first skew we could commercialize. So we made this mayonnaise. We ran it in January of 2015, launched it February 2nd of 2015. And we thought we had a year's supply of mayonnaise. We were like, if we sell this in the year, we'll be good. And we sold out $10 jar of mayonnaise, our first run in like one week. I mean, Mark and I were hand packing boxes in the Malibu Chamber of Commerce because we couldn't get the orders out the door fast enough. Holy cow. So that's an immediate success, I guess, is like... Well, we like made the product we want to make and then priced it what we needed to price in order to stay in business. And then we were like, we either have a product, a healthy business with good margins and a product that people are willing to pay for, pay a premium for. I mean, a big premium. $10 for a jar of mayonnaise is a lot of money then. It still is now, right? Um, But there was nothing else like it in the marketplace and consumers are making their own mayonnaise. They don't want the canola and the soybean oil. Most mayonnaise has sugar added to it. Like, you know, it was nasty, but mayonnaise is big category, right? It's a huge category in the grocery store that had seen no innovation. So we said like, let's test this. Let's just like see if we can sell this online. And if we can, we have a business. And if we can't, we don't have a business. We weren't going to go like create some lesser than product and like price it at, you know, if we would have hired an MBA, we would have like done market research. And then we would have formulated a product they would have told us it's going to retail for 10.99 if you want 50 percent gross margin we would have said that's crazy no one will ever buy that we got to bring the price down to six dollars okay if you want to get the price down to six dollars you're going to need to blend with sunflower and safflower oil okay we'll do that and then we would have gone to market with a beautiful business plan on a page and we would have failed so we created like the product we wanted to create in the marketplace and we just tested like are people willing to pay for this at a 
profit margin that we can keep the lights on with and do we have a business or not? And that was kind of like what our first run was. And then we were like, oh, we have a business. <laughs> um, and then we were operating just in time inventory like for our entire first year. We kept, we'd run again and then we would sell it out right like a week later our next production run would be. So we had like accidental just in time inventory for the first 12 months. What was that? What was the mindset like? What was it like living in a company that is so successful so quickly? And how did you feel like that shaped the years to come after that? Just for yourself personally. I'm just gonna wait for that motorcycle to go away. I can't really hear it that much. I... You can't. Okay. Um. I mean, it was really fun. Like champagne problems all day right like I don't know I would take those kind of like high growth problems are my favorite problems versus like nobody wants to buy your product so we had all of those problems like manufacturing issues and then it wouldn't be that big of a deal for someone else but it was for us because we were out of inventory and we couldn't fill you know slots on the shelf I would say the biggest issues we had were just like building out the team um but it was a blast I mean we had an absolute blast growing Primal Kitchen I mean, it was super fun. And that's the biggest, that's, I, I think that's the biggest lie people talk about with entrepreneurship. They're like, this should suck. You should hate this. Everything's going to be hard. Like, listen, I would like my day consisted of like, and I worked my ass off our the first year. We had no other employees. I remember like Adam leaving for work. I was like in my pajamas. Adam coming home from work at 8 p.m. I'm still in the same pajamas. I haven't left the apartment all day. I'm like, I remember spending all this time doing Whole Foods paperwork. And someone was like, why don't you have your broker do that? And I was like, your broker does that? And they were like, yeah. And I had like spent like 24 hours trying to fill out all the paperwork. Is like not my strong suit. Um, trying to fill out all this paperwork that I didn't even need to do. Because little did I know like the people we were paying monthly could have just done it for me. So I worked really hard um the first year but also like my days were like driving to Malibu to meet I'd leave at like 10 I'd get to Malibu at like 11 I'd meet Mark there we'd go to lunch at Coogie's like Robert De Niro would be like here Pamela Anderson would be like there and we'd have like a meeting over lunch and then I would just sometimes surf in Malibu and then drive home like Mark is not like uh we're not like gluttons for punishment we're both very much like like work hard, play hard, work hard, play harder. Like I always tell my kids, like, be kind, work hard, play harder. I don't know. But that's, a, I mean, that's like the, that is like the anti-hustle culture. Like that's the anti-hustle culture. Everybody says it needs to be 18 hour days. You need to hate your life. You need everybody. No, we never hated our lives. I don't believe in the hustle culture. I think that's a bunch of bullshit. You're like wasting your time hustling. You're not living like Fuck that. That's for the birds. Like, no way. <laughs> I would never do that. I've never been like that. I have would never do that. That's no. Just not true. That's just not my thing. Like, it's just so unnecessary. I don't know what you're trying to prove. But that's the difference between, like, marathon runners and, like, surfers, in my opinion. Like, one of my really good friends, she went to Brown. She's super smart, like an overachiever. And she's a marathon runner. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a surfer. And this is, like, why. Because my parents were like, sees us get degrees, and her parents were like crying when she didn't get into Princeton, right? That she had to go to Brown, you know? Like, I just think it's too much. I don't know. So, no, I'm not into it. I'm just not, it's not worth it. I'd rather be poor, live off eight grand a year in South America, and like enjoy my life. I mean, life's too short. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Now, building a team, um, I think for most entrepreneurs, that's like, the dream, I guess it's the dream. And it's also like, I think your way, the way that you guys built primal in light of the, what you just said about enjoying building it, enjoying every, you know, fa obviously not every day is going to be a perfect day, but like you enjoyed building it. And I'd imagine that had a lot to do with the team that you built. So what was the process and what was like the steps that you took to build, uh, build the team that you guys have today? Yeah. So when I started, Mark had, employees but no one besides me was working on primal kitchen like dedicated we, i had support from people who were running other facets of his business he was selling supplements at the time but i didn't have any like dedicated primal kitchen people so i was like i started the instagram account on my phone the first year i was managing our social media i was reaching out to influencers direct i was going to sales meetings i was managing our co-mans who were making all of our products i was hiring our broker i was doing everything um and then a year in, I hired my best friend, Anna, who I moved to South America with after college. I've known Anna 
my whole life practically. And she was miserable at her job. And I knew she was smart, awesome, and has like a great outlook on life and is just like an amazing human. So she was working at the University of Minnesota at the time. And before that, she had worked for Toro, which is like a big lawnmower company. And I was like, she's perfect. She can come in and do anything for me. <laughs> um, so I, Mark met Anna and then Anna was our first employee. And then we hired out of, we hired our second employee, Alex. And I had brought on Amanda, who had hired me at a past company at Kavita. I brought Amanda on as like a consultant. She had just had her third baby and she was like not wanting to work and I was begging her. I was finally like, I'll just pay you to just answer the phone when I have questions. Um, so she came on, she now works for us full time, but it was took me a while to convince her to come on full time. And then I also brought on another person who had hired me in the past, Rick. So Rick was like our third wheel. Me, Mark and Rick ran, pretty much ran the company. So Rick came on and took over like CFO, COO responsibilities eventually like managed all the commands and did all the things that you know I was like hesitant to let go of but in hindsight like wow did I really need to like pass some of that stuff off to someone who actually knew what they were doing um so yeah the team organically was just built kind of out of people who have hired me historically friends of mine um like my best friend in Los Angeles works for us she still runs the Target account Kelly a girl I played soccer with in high school I brought her out of the beer industry and she sells um and manages some of our natural sales business for us and then like other people's network so like Anna's best friend from college manages our Amazon business so we just like built out a very like a network of people that was very much from my personal network. But I think what that did was set the tone for the kind of employees we wanted and like a very like family friendly environment. Um, yeah. So, so what was like the culture of Primal Kitchen? Well, look, Mark's like a culture creator, right? Like he kind of is credited with popularizing the paleo movement. So the culture of Primal Kitchen was very much a blend of like my like motivated network of young and old professionals who are awesome, who may have known nothing about food and beverage. And then like all these people that just would do anything to be around Mark because he's such like an inspirational, awesome person. So I think that was like the blend. And, and uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but how, what was the dynamic of working with friends? Because I know there's a lot of opinions out there about working with friends. Yeah, I love working with friends. I still work with all my friends. I still work at Primal Kitchen and all my friends still work at Primal Kitchen. I never hired a friend that doesn't still work at Primal Kitchen. They're all here. So clearly it's working for us. Um, <laughs> it's fun. I don't micromanage my friends. I hired smart people who are awesome at their jobs and they just like kill it and it's all good yeah i mean that's that's pretty straightforward okay so i mean we we touched on i feel like enough on the business but i mean fast forward through a lot of years of growth and amazing stuff come to now you guys sold four years ago to Kraft Heinz. um what is what is your north star now and that's a big question but do you want to talk a little bit about like the sale of the company yes absolutely kind of yeah kind of interesting before we get to like yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so fast forward, we knew when we launched the company that we wanted to sell, like, and there's no money to be made in food unless you exit your company. It's like margins are really slim. They're even slimmer now. It's just like a really tough business uh, to actually like cash flow revenue in unless you're in the supplement space. But in food, it's hard. It's hard in beverage, maybe even harder. It's just a tough industry. So we knew we wanted to sell the company. In 2015, Mark was very transparent with me and he's like you know if we could just grow this and sell it for 30 million i'd be happy and i was like okay and then like a year later he's like if we could just grow this and sell it for 100 million i'd be happy and i was like okay here we are right um and then he was like you know i think if we could sell it for 200 million like that would be good and then it was like 300 and then it just like started every year like the number changed um and i was like mark you know stop smoking your own crack man like whatever but we we had an interesting growth trajectory like we went from our first year we did like one and a half million with one skew we expanded into multiple categories did like I don't know 13 million the next year 26 the next year 50 and we exited the year that we finished in 50 million in in net sales we exited to Kraft Heinz um we never raised money Mark and I owned 95 percent of Primal Kitchen at the time in which we sell we sold we did like a little friends and family round a year before we exited but we never did like a 
it wasn't even, we never did like a series A. We never raised venture capital or private equity money. We kind of just bootstrapped and ran the whole thing on a line of credit that Mark had a personal guarantee on. Yeah. The line I, of credit was up to like nine million at one point. <laughs> so what? No you, pressure. Yeah. So like, what? I mean, it, that's interesting that he had this idea of like it, the number kept going up. When? When did you guys? What did the conversation look like when you guys were like, okay, we have a potential buyer, and were you sell? Were you sending out your guys' P and Ls every year to? No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. It It's like we hired an investment banker to go sell the business for us at like one point in time. So we interviewed all of these investment bankers and they came and did like a thing called a bake off where they um, we had heard at the time you needed to get your business to 50 million in revenue before you could exit. Now I would say it's like higher than that. Um, it used to be like 30 million and then it was like 50. Now, who knows? I mean, I don't know. You probably want to get your business up to 100 million before you exit at this point. Yeah. But um, at the time it was like 50. That was like the term circulating in the industry so we were like okay we're gonna end the year at 50 like now would be a good time to sell um and we're like we don't know what's gonna happen in the world like it was an election year we're like it could get crazy this is 2018 um little did we know that we were, is like in for real, <laughs> real chaos um <laughs> but we're like man it could get like really nuts like we just we this personal guarantee is stressful like it's hard to make money like let's bring someone on who can like help us grow this thing so we um we hired we went and interviewed a bunch of investment bankers we did like a bake-off that's like the term for it I didn't know this we did a bake-off we had all these guys it was all guys come out and pitch us to try and be the ones who would get to sell the business for us they take a cut on the sale it's just like a normal whole thing maybe some people know maybe some people don't who are listening how this goes I didn't realize this is how this went so we had like six probably six bankers came out and they met with me Mark and Rick at the Soho house in Malibu so we're like oceanfront like Jennifer Garner's over there you know like all the Patrick Dempsey's over there it's like life is like so Malibu great at the time um and they bring out like you know seven or eight people from their bank and their big thick book on like what they think they can sell your company for and like we listen to all these pitches and I always say like as a woman in business like men have been bullshitting me my whole life so I have like a distinct advantage over like Mark for instance um and we interviewed him and everyone, Mark would be like, oh my God, you know, he would like totally like, he was kind of like bought in, right? Like, I think there's like male egos at play. And I was just like, no, like big swing and dick, big swing and dick, big swing and dick. Like none of these guys know what they're talking about. They don't know the food space really well. Like they, we, there was just no hell yes. I'm a big believer in like, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. So we actually just put the process on hold. Um, that fall, we waited until the spring and got introduced to Romitha Mally, who sold, ended up selling Primal Kitchen for us um, through our friends at Thrive Market. They were like, oh, just hire Romitha. She's the best. We met her at Expo West. And I was like, oh, well, this is a no-brainer. I mean, she was like an ex-food analyst. She had sold um, she had sold Dollar Shave Club to Unilever. She had sold Buy Energy Drinks to Dr. Pepper Snapper Group for $2 billion. She had sold Blue Buffalo Dog Food to General Mills for $2 billion. I mean, she really like, she wasn't just like, a suit who attended a meeting with a big oversized deck that was so like talk about making up for lack of other things like she just really like was clear she knew what she was doing so that was like a no-brainer we hired her in like I don't know April or May I can't even remember and then she led us through the whole like a whole there's a whole process when you're selling your business you like bring out an investment banker and then you like prepare a data room and then they you go do like initial meetings and you find out who's interested and then like the meetings kind of progress in intensity. I was 32 weeks pregnant. We did like, we get to, you get to management presentations, which is like when the people who have put in like an unofficial offer more or less on like, we think we'd pay X, Y, or Z for this business. Do we make it to like the next round to continue the conversation? And we had like four days of management presentations. So they were like eight hour meetings with, you know, big CPG companies, Kraft Heinz obviously being one of them. Um, and it's me, Mark and Rick and the investment bankers and whatever. And I'm 32 weeks pregnant. Like I'm so pregnant, <laughs> like huge, <laughs> super pregnant with my first. Um, but we did the management presentations and then, you know, the whole process just kind of pro progresses. Romitha manages the whole thing. Final bids come in and then we, you enter into like a term sheet with who you're going to sell your company to. And that ended up being Kraft Heinz. How did you navigate having like hard conversations with whether it was your employees i'd imagine 
at that time, things were pretty stressful between like the personal guarantee, like you and Mark probably, was there any, how did you navigate if there was any hard conversations or just like disagreements with your upper, upper management? And then, I mean, the employees part isn't really important, but like, how did you negotiate having, or how did you manage having hard conversations with guys like Mark and just like anybody in, in that, in that space during that time? We didn't have any hard conversations because we kept like the sale of the company under wrap. So only like a few people knew about it. We like didn't tell anybody we were working on that. And then something Mark and I had talked about for years, literally like years before we sold the company was like how we wanted to bonus every single person who worked for us. So because we didn't, we weren't set up for like employee equity. We just didn't do that at the beginning. Um, and so we decided we were going to like arbitrarily give massive bonuses to our employees um, down to like warehouse staff, like front desk, like every single employee who worked for us at the time of the sale got a bonus. And some of the bonuses were like life-changing amounts of money, like substantial amounts of money. Like Romita, when we sold the company, Romita was like, I've never seen two founders so generous with their management team as I have from Primal Kitchen. So it was cool. That was like the best day ever as a boss. Like we, the, we were in the process of selling the company. We signed the deal like November 28th or something. It got leaked to the press. So we thought we had time to like call everyone and tell them all, all everyone who worked for us. But we, we ran out of time because the story broke. Primal Kitchen is going to be sold. We were like, oh shit. So Mark and I spent the whole morning. We divvied up our employee list and we spent the whole morning calling every single person being like, hey, we sold the company. We're going to give you a bonus to stay on for the next like two years at least and also as a thank you for getting us here like we're bonusing you some obscene amount of money I mean it was like what was that conversation like with Anna did you were you the one that called Anna yeah I called Anna I mean and I both called Anna she was like our first employee I mean we were all crying I mean we gave Anna like a life-changing amount of money right so she was like sobbing she's like this is amazing you know we had a lot of people like in tears like oh I had this bill and I didn't know how I was gonna do this and a lot of like it was like a sob fest like Mark and I were just like crying the whole day like (laughs) yeah it was a cool like event for everyone and Kraft Heinz really was like very serious about wanting to let us continue to run the business they incentivized us to stay on like all of our employees like it was very much a big topic of conversation at the time of the sale and I'm still running Primal Kitchen and we sold four and a half years ago so my whole team is still here Anna's still here everyone's still here like it's so unheard of in the food space most people sell their company and they exit they're out of there like you know within a year to be here, like I didn't think I'd be here this long, but I'm here. I'm still running the business. The whole team's still in place. I love the brand. It's like still so fun. So I think that's like a really unique part of just the Primal Kitchen story. Yeah, that is. So four years post um, post sale. Obviously, you've had three kids in that time frame. Or what? What has been the biggest difference professionally and personally from you know being you and Adam and now you Adam and plus three what has been that I don't even remember my life before I had kids I mean you have kids and you're like what I don't know what was that even like I don't know you can't even imagine what your priorities were before kids I feel like so you have no like you what was your priorities I mean my priorities before we had kids it was like just a lot of surfing and like you know a lot of like self stuff you become really self less when you have kids <laughs> kids just about other people especially when you have three kids in five years I mean although I maybe it's just that like that for everyone but no I mean yeah. three kids in five years isn't well I had kids. three kids in three and a half years but the oldest is now gonna be five so yeah that's incredibly intense yeah that's really really intense what have you uh what have you learned about yourself through that process I think like parenting is just an exercise in letting go So I think I've let go, like even Primal Kitchen was kind of like, it was a baby of mine in a sense, right? I think that was also like an exercise in letting go, like things are bigger than you. You don't need to like control everything, like sitting back and like observing and taking a breath is like oftentimes the best path forward. Um, But yeah, letting go is just a continual necessary as you're parenting I think and yeah. also as you're growing a business right like when you're when you start out you're doing everything yourself and then you have to like stop micromanaging stuff and you pass that off to someone else and that requires letting go so I think 
yeah, that's what I've learned is how to let go a lot more. What What is the biggest difference between kid one and kid three? Like in my specific kids? Or you mean just, just like, like having one or having three kids? Yeah, like the difference between the first six months of having your first kid versus the first six months of having your third kid. Talked about it a little bit. I mean, when you have one kid, it's like, I remember my sister-in-law, they have four, and she was like, oh my God, that's so cute. I remember like when we had one and like two of you change a diaper, and then you have two and you like never do that, and then you have three and you're like, I I haven't even talked to my husband in like two weeks. I don't know. So I think (laughs) that's the big difference of having like every every additional kid. But also you worry like a lot less. You know a little bit more. You've been through like the fevers and the rashes and the, you know, all that stuff. So it just becomes like a lot less of a worry, I think. What is your plan with uh, education with your kids? We are at like the most epic preschool ever in Los Angeles called Town and Country. If anybody's in LA, you should move here so you can send your kids to this preschool. Um, And it's a very like play based, non academic school. I'm really big on like not pushing the academics, even the reading. Like I think we're pushing it way too early on these kids. So I'm holding all my boys back. Riker is uh, my oldest, is a November birthday. So he's like TK, but I've got an end of May and a July birthday. I'm definitely doing an extra year of preschool and sending them when they're six. Um, So I am really struggling with what to do on the school thing, but I. I love their preschool because it's just like play based and it's like really they really foster like don't do anything for a kid that they can do for themselves. And also just like letting the kids figure it out. This is like a big parenting. What's an example of that? At their school, there's like a bike yard and they have like a, you know, bike circle. I think this is the perfect example. And I was at parent teacher night last night and she was saying like, you know, we purposely don't tell the kids like the bike circle goes this way because we want some kids to go this way and some kids to go the other way. And then when they crash, they have to talk about it and figure out how do we like make this bike thing work. And just like hearing the teacher talk about all these different instances of like, you know, I step back and like put them in situations where there's like conflict and where there's like things that need to be figured out. And then seeing how much more of like problem solvers they are and how they can like handle sticking up for themselves or if someone pushes them over it's like they don't run to me I want them to have a voice that says like hey don't push me over I didn't like that and this preschool just like that's just what they nail they like really nail the social aspect of that for this age so I'm just like so thankful that we could have that experience for them I don't know what we'll do for grade school yet Riker's gonna be in kindergarten next year who knows but I'm glad they have this like grounded kind of like toddler program that seems to be amazing. Oh, are you worried about the state of, well, obviously you're worried about it or you wouldn't be thinking about it this much, but the state of the current education system that you have to put so much time and energy and thought behind where are you going to send your kids to school and like what, like how do you see that currently as it, as it stands? I think I'm like a bit of a, we call them our our customers at Primal Kitchen. We call them never settlers. Like, I think I'm a bit of, like, a never settler. I love the preschool because I feel like they're in the perfect preschool. Like, I don't think there's any better preschool, right? And so I think what I'm trying to wrestle with myself is, like, how can you just send them somewhere that you're just, like, okay with? But you need to do that as an adult. Like, talk about letting go, right? Like, they might not be in the best perfect elementary school but like they're probably gonna be fine right so I don't know I'm just wrestling with kind of not always having to have the perfect best solution and learning how to like make do with not having the perfect best solution and when I say the perfect elementary school like my perfect elementary school would be like there's one in Michigan called like Upland Hills School or something like that and it's like the kids are basically like at camp they're outside like year round there's a bunch of cool schools in the Midwest that do this there's a really cool school one in a cool school in Traverse City there's one in Milwaukee Wisconsin so I would love for my kids to be like in an outdoor education program or there's a really cool um there's a really cool franchise school situation called um, Acton Academy, A-C-T-O-N. And they, it's like an entrepreneur out of teacher, like a PhD entrepreneur guy who taught at, taught entrepreneurship at University of Texas, Austin. He had his kids in Montessori and then was switching over to the public school and was just like, oh, this doesn't feel right. And created this whole kind of like, he, they started their own school in Texas. And then other people have like licensed the programming from them. And it's very like, let the kids figure it out. The kids run the classroom. If the classroom is messy, the kids 
have to be the ones to figure out like who's in charge of cleaning it what are the rules here so just like giving that sort of like autonomy to kids to figure it out on their own instead of like being authoritarian and figuring out for them I think is really important I would love to send my kids somewhere like that but there isn't one here and I don't know that I'm the person to start it I would love to fund someone else to do that but I just don't think I'm the one to start that but anyway so yeah what do you think uh, you kind of touched on a little bit but what do you think are the important values to instill in your kids when they're super super young at least from because you sounds like you've done a lot of research and sounds like you put a lot of time and energy into understanding how and being intentional in how you raise your kids but oh, that's such a personal question because like everybody has different values right so I think and we all have different traumas and I think a lot of times we're making parenting decisions based off like what traumas we're trying to avoid or not my dad always says you're gonna make a lot of mistakes as parents but you won't make the ones your parents made because they're so obvious to you that you're not going to do those and I kind of like think there's some validity to that but um I think when they're super super young like I always had easy babies, so it's hard to say. Like, I never had colic or anything, be but I was, like, a big fan of baby wearing, and, like, my babies were in bed with me. Our three-year-old's still in bed with me. Um, so I'm a big kind of, like, attachment parenting fan, if that works for you. I get it doesn't work for everyone, but I could never do, like, the cried-out sleeping thing. It just, like, wasn't for me. Um, it almost, like, makes me want to break out in hives just thinking about it. But we had, you know, the kids were just always, like, I was always wearing them. I nursed on demand. I wasn't very, like, regimented with baby babies. I think they, like, tell you what they need. Like, I think nursing on demand is, like, a, a lot of people get on, like, a schedule. I think you can, like, try to rush some of the schedule stuff too much, and it causes just, like, more anxiety. It's, like, just nurse them when they cry and, like, don't stress about where they sleep. I don't know. Just don't stress so much. Like, we've made it a lot harder than it needs to be. Yeah, that's interesting. We touched on a lot of topics. Yeah. I, I definitely want to pick this back up, but we'll end it there. 